Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you made it through the rain. Uh, we've had some uh, soggy days here, and it's going to be, but it's dry here. So stay and enjoy this uh, this morning with us. And I'm very delighted that uh, the Foreign Minister Thornton was here with us today. We're delighted to welcome you to Washington. I think you've been here before, but not to CSIS. And so we're very honored that you would include us in your itinerary during your visit. Um, you know, Washington is a, you know, we've got a very large and sophisticated um, policy community, but we're really kind of a one-trick pony. And when the only thing on the front line is North Korea, you know, our friends have to come here to remind us there are other parts of the world. And I, I say it's always very, very helpful to have uh, a visiting foreign minister come because it brings, it, it forces us to confront a much larger world that we just get preoccupied with the front pages. And we're going to explore some of that today with the foreign minister. It, uh, uh, Iceland has always had a very kind of a special position for us because it was crucial in, for our security, but it, it, uh, it was small enough that it, 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 it could tell us what it thought, you know, and of course I, that goes back to my days now 35 years ago, 45, 45 oh geez. Gare and I went to school at SICE together and, uh, and so we, we, we've, our, our lives have interwoven. He's, he's been a hell of a lot more successful than I've been, but, uh, but I'm quite pleased that he's willing to stay a friend and offered to have this opportunity for us here. Uh, the foreign minister, of course, has had a, a very rich and very active political career in Iceland. And, uh, and so it, he's one of those individuals that can integrate the internal thinking of the country and its exter external face. And we're going to have a chance to hear that today. We're going to talk about the Arctic and uh, uh, the geopolitics of the Arctic. We were just talking a little bit earlier while we were uh, just gathering. Um, you know, it's become a more classic dynamic environment, you know, the Russians are making themselves known and visible and uh, an active diplomacy on their part and it really is putting a challenge and a test to a foreign minister for Iceland. So we're, we're very fortunate to have you here today. Uh, thank you very much. I would tell everybody, oh first I forgot to say, you know, in case we have a little emergency we'll hear a little voice. Heather's in charge of keeping you all safe and she's going to tell you to go right through this door. There's a exit down to the street. We'll take two left-hand turns and go across to National Geographic. They've got a great show on right now. We'll pay for everybody's ticket, you know, so we'll take care of you. Just, just follow Heather if we have to do anything. Uh, and I would say we are going to have to end very promptly at 1130 because the foreign minister has to be at the World Bank at uh, 1145. So, Foreign Minister, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Would you please welcome Foreign Minister Thoritsen with your warm applause. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking uh, CSIS for organizing this meeting. It's an honor for me to address you and a valuable opportunity to reflect on some of the issues Iceland considers important during times of global uncertainty. Today, I want to talk to you about three things. First, Iceland as a strategic partner to the US. Second, how and why we shouldn't broaden and strengthen our relationship. And thirdly, the importance of American leadership in the world. Let me begin with the strategic partnership. They say geography is destiny. How true in the case of Iceland, an island in the middle of the North Atlantic Sea where America and Europe meet. Literally, in geographical terms, the two continental shelves of America and Europe. For centuries, our geography was both a curse and a blessing. In addition to an unforgiving climate and destructive volcanoes, a small population lived in a relatively isolation and relied on imported basic necessities for survival. At the same time, these conditions meant that Iceland was more or less sheltered from continuous great power conflicts in the continent, and for about 500 years, Iceland remained a part of the Kingdom of Denmark. The most sought-after sought resource of Iceland was fish, 
which was harvest, harvested at different times by foreign powers such as England and France. But none of them left a significant footprint in the country, <coughs> and the last foreign fishing vessel was pushed out of Icelandic waters following the Cod Wars in the 1970s. The development of naval technology, particularly submarines, and later aviation, including long-range aircraft, changed our situation dramatically. Iceland suddenly became a strategic hub. The first indication of changing circumstances appeared during the First World War, and they were firmly in place when the Second World War broke out. While our ge geography, our remoteness, had in previous time ensured foreign nations did not seek to gain a foothold in Iceland permanently, technological progress and the changing strategic landscape meant that by 1940, our geography necessity an intervention by the Western allies. Our geography had not changed, but other conditions had. When Norway and Denmark were occupied by the Nazis in 1940s, the British had no choice other than to send military forces to Iceland for the defense of the North Atlantic Sea routes. Similarly, in pre Pearl Harbor 1941, the United States realized that a forward presence in Iceland was essential to sustaining Britain and to, de and to the defense of the eastern U.S. seaport. That year, U.S. troops replaced the British force in Iceland. To be able to take on this role, however, the U.S. government had to define Iceland as a part of its hemisphere, under its sphere of interest, in line with the Monroe Doctrine, which had been the prevailing foreign policy in the U.S and would remain so until Pearl Harbor was attacked and the, and the U.S. entered the war. This development indicated a shift in the strategic importance of Iceland and represented the birth of the transatlantic link. During the Cold War, secure communications between North America and Europe became fundamental to the credibility and viability of NATO and a forward position in the North Atlantic remained crucial to the defense of the North American mainland. In fact, in the 1970s and 1980s, experts frequently referred to Iceland Keplavik as the anti-submarine warfare capital of the world, and flights by Soviet long-range bombers into the Icelandic military identification zone were common. Fortunately, the Soviet Union collapse and the Cold War ended without a major conflict. There was no return to geographic remoteness for Iceland, however. Other factors, including changes taking place in the Arctic, meant it would remain strategically located. And with the aviation and tourism experience a boom, Iceland has also become a different kind of hub between Europe and North America linking the two continents together, as well as the people seeking to make use of more frequent flights. You may not be aware of this, but Iceland has been seeing extraordinary changes in its relationship with US citizens because of the current aviation and tourist boom. In 2017, we saw an increase in visitors from North America of 108,000 people, which is a 363 increase from 2016, bringing the overall number up to 680,000 people. As a matter of fact, there are more direct flights every single day from Iceland to the US than there are from all other Nordic countries in a week. So while US troops may have left Iceland in 2006 when the Keplake base was closed, you Americans have recently been coming to visit us in ever bigger numbers, which we welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> turning back on the issue of security, and more specifically Russia, the optimism re released by the end of the Cold War has in recent months and years dram dramatically receded. Indeed, we have lately been confronted with a question whether we are witnessing the beginning of a new Cold War. I would not go this far in comparison. The Cold War was somewhat unique 
and Russia today is not the Soviet Union. However, there is every reason to be worried about Russia's willingness to use its modernized armed forces unilaterally abroad. Russia's annexation of Crimea and its direct support for separatists in the eastern Ukraine were game changers, both in terms of respect for international law and post-Cold War European stability and security architecture. The recent assassination attempt in the United Kingdom, where a Russian-produced nerve agent, Novichok, was used against a British citizen, a former Russian spy and his daughter, was also a shocking development, one which only widens the gulf between the West and Russia. Russia's intervention in Syria and their defense of the Assad regime, even in the face of repeated use of chemical weapons, has also contributed to the current climate of distrust. Not to mention their suspected interference in the 2016 US elections. Iceland relations with Russia, and before that Soviet Union, Union have traditionally been cordial, with particular focus on trade. This all changed in 2014, with Russia's action in the Crimea and in Ukraine, where territorial borders were violated and changed with the use of military force, something we have not seen in Europe since the Second World War. Iceland has, from the outset, participated in the sanction regime. Russian countermeasures have not, not changed our policies, although Iceland have been adversely hit with the Russian countersanction, causing 95 percent decrease in export to Russia. We feel strongly about the principles involved. For a smaller country like Iceland, the respect and adherence to international law means everything. It is our sword, shield, and shelter, so to speak. Iceland's relationship with Russia is currently also affected by the Salisbury incident, which we take very seriously and have sided with the UK and other allies. The use of chemical weapons, whether in Syria or Europe, cannot be normalized and tolerated and needs to have consequences. We have taken measure and postponed all high-level bilateral meetings until further notice, and our dignitaries will be boycotting the World Cup in Russia this summer, where our national team has qualified for the first time, an achievement that we as a nation are extremely proud of. Closer to home, in the North Atlantic, we also experienced a Russian military comeback already 11, 12 years ago. Paradoxically, when, when the last of the US forces, permanently based in Iceland, had been withdrawn in 2006, Russia, on virtually the same day, chose to resume, resume its strategic bomber flights. Furthermore, in recent years, we have seen a steep increase in Russian submarine activities in the North Atlantic and a greater number of operational submarines, including new <coughs> and more advanced vessels, are sailing through the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, GEO gap, and thereby demonstrating a capability to disrupt transatlantic communication and to threaten the North American mainland, for example, with cruise missiles. This development has resulted in increased and rotational presence of U.S. and Allied forces in Iceland for air policing and submarine surveillance. <clears throat> in 2014, Allied maritime surveillance aircraft operated out of Iceland for a total of 21 days. Since then, the number has risen year by year, and in 2017, the number reached 153 days. Last year, a large submarine surveillance exercise, Dynamic Mongoose, took a place south of Iceland. And later this year, Triton Juncture will take place in Norway and Iceland. I can safely say that no Western country wants a return to Cold War conditions, with all the dangers and expensive involved. Western countries want normal relations with Russia, as far as this is possible. But to pretend that nothing serious happened in 2014 would be opportunistic and short-sighted, 
and to ignore Russian behavior in the UK recently would be a naive and wrong. There are not isolated incidents, but represent a pattern which also include cyber and hybrid tactics. Disinformation and propaganda and meddling in domestic affairs, including elections. Attempting to sow division between the countries in the West has become a modus operandi for Russian authorities. Thankfully, however, the Western powers have shown remarkably uni unity and solidarity, which are key features and continue to characterize our transatlantic relations. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to our transatlantic alliance, NATO. As the only founding member of NATO without national armed forces, Iceland relies on Article 5 and the bilateral defense agreement with the US. Nonetheless, we contribute in many different ways to our national defense and the alliance through civilian cap capabilities, personal and experience, and have our own perspective on security development in our region in a broad sense. This is reflected in our national security policy, which enjoys cross-party support and sets the framework for the security and defense policy of our broadly-based coalition government. Our national security policy takes a holistic approach to the security concept and includes elements of active foreign policy, defense policy, and civil security alike. This is important, and in our view, we should not only focus on inputs and percentages on de defense expenditures. There are various other ways to contribute to our common security. For example, with the stroke of pen, the Icelandic GDP shrunk by 1% as a result of Russian countersanctions. That was the price of solidarity at that time. We are not complaining. I am simply saying that there are different ways of paying the bill. There also need to be a sensible division of labor and balance between us as allies and partners. If all nations would reach their 2 percent on military expenditure tomorrow, there would be chaos. We would, not, we would not be able to spend that money wisely and for our common good. We need to respect national sensitivities under different circumstances. At the same time, we all acknowledge that European countries need to assume further responsibility for our own and common security. This, is, this also applies to Iceland, and since 2014, we have dramatically increased our contribution to security and defense, 20 30 percent between years, both at home and the NATO part in particular. We will continue on this path. The themes of the upcoming Brussels summit this summer are shaping up and birth sharing and relations with Russia will surely feature prominently. We are also pleased with the increased prominence given to the North Atlantic in preparation for the summit, including the establishment of a new transatlantic command in Norfolk and a new political military assessment for the region. After all, NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The alliance has a good story to tell, and we hope to see continued unity and solidarity at the summit. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to my second point on how we should and must broaden and strengthen our partnership, and I want to focus on the Arctic in particular. Recently, increasing attention is being given to security in the Arctic and the circumpolar region include so-called soft and hard security. I would like to offer an Icelandic perspective on some of the challenges in what we often refer to as the high north, and again, geography plays a key role. Iceland is located centrally in the North Atlantic, with Greenland to the west, and the Faroe Island, the UK, and Norway to the east. The Arctic Circle touches Iceland's northern tip, and straight lines can be drawn through the Atlantic, respectively, to the North and South Poles. Successive Icelandic uh, governments have expressed their hope that the Arctic would not be militarized, 
beyond the level seen following the end of the Cold War, a position that is manifested in our Arctic policy from 2011, which was adopted through a consensus across the political spectrum. In most capitals where the Arctic is on the agenda, there is recognition of legitimate Russian security interest in the region and the need to safeguard them with credible defense capabilities. However, the scope, speed, and apparent ambition of the Russian military buildup in the Arctic does raise questions. And again, the pattern we see in the North Atlantic and elsewhere are causes of major concerns, as I have mentioned. Nevertheless, there are many reasons for optimism in the high north where geography is actually not constant. constant. In fact, it is rapidly changing. With growing global awareness of the economic potentials and ecological fragility of the Arctic as a result of climate change, including concerns over conditions in the oceans, it is reassuring to witness rapidly expanding constructive political contacts and practical cooperation in both bilateral and multilateral flora. This global focus is long overdue. The geographic size of the Arctic is equal to the whole of Africa. The region includes the largest pristine wilderness in the world, a natural heritage to be safeguarded for future generations, while allowing for economic development for the benefit of the four million people who live there. The emission of the greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases is minimal in the Arctic, but the consequences of climate change are faster and more visible there than any other place on Earth. The Arctic Council plays a key role in supporting environmental protections in the Arctic on the basis of scientific cooperation and research, taking into account the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. At the same time, the Council promotes sustainable development in the Arctic. People who live in the Arctic should enjoy security and prosperity, including local health care, education, employment and communication. Hence, we need a balanced and realistic approach, where protections of the environment and economic development go hand in hand and the fundamental interests of the inhabitants are respected. Three legally binding agreements have been negotiated under the oil species of the Arctic Councils on search and rescue, protective measures against oil spills, and international scientific cooperation. Furthermore, the Member State Coast Guards cooperate closely within the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. Rapidly growing tourism into distant and vulnerable parts of the regions calls for clear guidelines for tour operators and more efficient search and rescue capabilities as well as pre preventative measures. All of these issues are considered in relation to the agenda for the Icelandic chairmanship of the Arctic Council starting, starting in May 2019. More generally, we hope to reinforce the position of the Arctic Council as the premier forum for international deliberation on Arctic issues. All member states of the Arctic Council have a large stakes in its continued success. That's why it is, has been possible to insulate this important forum from differences in other areas. That also explains why military security is not on the agenda. This separation is not always easy to maintain. The conflict in Ukraine and chemical attacks in the UK and Syria involve fundamental principle which affect most other aspects of international relations. But there is an understanding that the urgency of safeguarding mutual interest in the Arctic demands specific dialogue and cooperation. The clearly defined focus of the Arctic Council makes this possible. Ladies and gentlemen, it is worth no noting how dramatic the changes taking place in the Arctic really are with the ice cap preceding and opening up of alternative sailing routes connecting Asia with Europe and North America. The Asian powerhouses are all interested in the Arctic and have an observership status in the Arctic Council. This includes Japan, South Korea, 
Singapore, India, and China. China has recently adopted an Arctic strategy and the Belt and Road Initiative speaks of a new Arctic Silk Route connecting Asia with Europe. China is on the rise and growing. The Chinese middle class, which has the means to travel and spend money, is more numerous than all citizens of North America. This global trend is likely to continue where Asia will continue to grow and prosper. This is, by and large, good news, and all countries, including mine, are increasingly look towards Asia, including China, in developing our relations. We are, however, also very mindful of the differences between China and Western countries. We sometimes see the world differently. We do not always share the same values. We do and will have our differences, for example, on human rights, Therefore, our cooperation in the Arctic and elsewhere needs to be transparent and based on reciprocity and mutual respect. We welcome China's and other Asian countries' interest in our region as long as international rules are respected. In fact, landmark negotiations on potential future Central Arctic fisheries have recently been concluded between 10 states, including Iceland, United States, Russia, China, Japan, and South Korea. This is the kind of cooperation that we want, built on scientific evidence and international law. Our bilateral relations with China are also good, for example, in the field of geothermal energy and scientific cooperation. We also have a well-functioning bilateral free trade agreement with China, which has benefited both countries. My only remark is the fact that we do not have a similar free trade agreement with the United States, our close, closest ally and most important market. And I have used this visit in Washington to reiterate that point. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the third and final point, the importance of American leadership going forward. There are so many things we tend, tend to take for granted. Democracy, rule of law, human rights. But these are not sure things. They must be, pre be protected and preserved. The history of our two nations, the very existence of the transatlantic links, is all about those values. The reason why the Americans came to Iceland in 1941 was to uphold freedom against tyranny. And following the war, America shaped the world order on the basics of security, free trade, and the values of free and open societies. And the world has prospered. Now we see new superpowers emerging. But if given the opportunity to shape the world we live in, will they have the same positive effects? We often talk about the free world as a part of the world. Why? Because there's a part that is not free. Democracy and freedom are not terms in international agreements. They're a way of life. Freedom of speech, in our understandings, also mean, means freedom after speech. The things we take for granted can easily disappear. The new world order could be totally different from the ones that has brought us freedom, security, and prosperity over the last seven decades. This is not the time to be disengaged. This is not the time to lead the states to others. We need positive leadership in these times or rapid changes. We need solidarity between nations that share the same values. Ronald Reagan described America as a shining city on a hill. We still need that vision, now perhaps more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to end my speech by stressing the importance of Iceland's relationship with the United States. It stands on solid ground and benefits both countries. We have a strong defense cooperation, excellent people-to-people -people contacts, 
through tourism and frequent flight connections. We look forward to our continued engagement in Arctic affairs as Iceland assumes chairmanship in the Arctic Council and there is still untapped potential in our trade relations. We will continue to look for US leadership in the global arena in times of increased uncertainties, with Russia growing more assertive, China more confident, and Europe preoccupied with internal affairs. Old alliance must be maintained and nurtured, and in Iceland you have a long-standing and trustworthy ally. These are testing times, and together we must champion of our common values, multilateralism, which both our countries gain from, and the international rules-based order. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Mr. Minister, thank you so much. You know, when you have such a comprehensive set of remarks, it makes my questions harder because I was just checking them off. You covered that, you talked about that, but uh, I'll try to manage a few questions here, and I know our audience uh, will, will want to um, offer their thoughts as well. I, I have to thank you, first and foremost. Sometimes we launch right in today, into today's challenges, and we don't talk about the context in our history. And uh, there are two things that I think that really struck me. To remember that Iceland is a critical part of defending the United States. And the United States then joins in solidarity with Iceland to enhance its defense and its security. That we have to think of it that way, not as allies as burdens, mm -hmm. but as allies are protecting the United States. And, and I thank you for, for those important comments, as well as I think as we head towards the July NATO summit, I think we can now say with confidence that North Atlantic is now back mm -hmm. into NATO mm -hmm. uh, with the Atlantic Command. Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna have you put your politician hat on, uh, mm -hmm. not your foreign minister hat <laughs> per se, because I've been reading some articles and some quotes in the Icelandic press mm -hmm. that, you know, the concern is this starting to feel like we're returning a bit to that Cold War-like military posture. It's not going to go back to the extent that it was, but we have forces rotating in Keflavik. Uh, we have now uh, a real focus on anti-submarine warfare. Mm. How is the domestic opinion about Russia here in the United States? It's quite divisive mm. because of the uh, interference in the election and different people interpret that very differently. What is this like in Iceland's public opinion on the Russia threat? And how much work have you had to do to talk to the Icelandic people about what that threat means and why Iceland has to spend more uh, and increase its defense uh, posture? Well, I have had to uh, take a quite a lot of time discussing that. Uh, of course, we are uh, used to be, uh, we witnessed it, at least my generation, uh, we witnessed the Cold War. <coughs> and we knew uh, the stand Iceland had at that time. And then we saw, of course, very good times in that sense that uh, the tension was not there. And the uh, reason we have, uh, the NATO has not been active in the North Atlantic, it was not, maybe, uh, we didn't need to do so. And uh, we, we tend to forget things very quickly that I think it's 10 years ago but the Russians uh, and the Americans were uh, practicing together in, in uh, North or South Carolina, uh, military drills. So you're just, then it's just things change very rapidly. And I think, and it comes to uh, the same thing that when we share the same values and we take them for granted, we also need to explain it to our people what it means. Because uh, when you take something to grant it, then uh, you do not see any threats or dangers. And of course, we know all about how they have been trying to uh, involve in uh, domestic issues, the Russians. And of course, it happens also in Iceland. So for me, becoming a foreign minister, I've been active in politics for a very long time. And I was brought up when I started the youth organization. Then we, we uh, 
in my party, everyone knew everything about the Geogate and the importance of NATO and, and all those things. So I can come back and you can see uh, at least some similarities, to say the least. But you need, really need to uh, explain those and why it's important to uh, stand together, why international law is important for everyone and exactly, especially for uh, small countries. I'm, I'm not complaining, this is just a part of my job, but I think it's very important that uh, this goes, I think, for every Western country, that we need take, to take this discussion. I, I get the question, I mean, why are you taking a part in this uh, solidarity uh, with, the, uh, with other countries that are often not very nice to us? Uh, you know, the Americans left when they just felt like it. Uh, the UK, they, they have uh, treated us bad in, in the ICE case and so on. But the Russians, they are always nice, so, and we are so small, we do not matter. I'm not saying this is a majority opinion, far from it. But yeah. this is sure. the discussion I need to take, and we need to take. And uh, we, well, especially we need to uh, explain to the younger generations who have been so fortunate not to see any of the things that we have seen. Uh, because uh, we cannot take these things for granted. We have to preserve it. And we really have to nurture our relationship between Western nations, because as, as I mentioned, we could foresee a new world order which was not based on the values we have based on so far. And that would be horrible. Yeah, I, I think your, your point on the, the next generation, we have to make NATO as vital and relevant and robust uh, to a next generation, and I think we're just having a hard time having that conversation. Again, it's rather than seeing an alliance as a burden mm -hmm. and seeing as a privilege and our, our ultimate security for sure. And I, I think we're, we're all struggling that. Are you hopeful about the upcoming summit? Uh, I, you know, when, when you said about there's different ways of paying the bill, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure mm -hmm. President Trump would agree with you. He's pretty focused on that. 2% mark, all allies made a commitment in 2014 at the mm -hmm. Wales Summit to say we're going to get there by 2024. Mm -hmm. We had uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel just say yesterday, well, we'll get to 1.5% maybe by 2024. Mm -hmm. Alliances have to keep commitments too. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think the, the alliance and the, the leaders will deal with that issue in July? Well, what we have seen in NATO is that I think every country more or less have been more active, yeah. uh, putting more contribution. But it's also important that we do it in as sensible way as possible. Right. And the whole idea with, with the alliance is that we work together. And if we're going to have a credible defense uh, system, uh, and now the, if you go to a NATO meeting, it needs everywhere. It's 360 degree. Uh, me and others are talking about the North Atlantic, but of course there's Mediterranean, uh, the borders with Russia and, and uh, so on. So I think it's just, I, I think the will is there, I think the political will is there, and I think there's the understanding. Trump was, of course, not the only American president right. who spoke about those Many things. Many have before, exactly. Yeah, exactly, and uh, so, no, I'm rather, uh, I'm rather optimistic, and I think that uh, um, when it comes to NATO, the understanding of the leaders of the country are, are there about the importance of NATO, they want to contribute uh, more, but of course we have to do it in, in the right way. There are different threats than only uh, when it comes to traditional warfare. We, we see this uh, cyber threats, which is really active, I think, everywhere. So uh, NATO also needs to uh, work uh, different than uh, it, when it was formed and in, during the Cold War. So, and, uh, that, but I, I, I have to admit, I am uh, optimistic Good. when it comes to, to NATO. Good. Wow, we're going to be optimistic too, absolutely. Let me turn to China a little bit. We um, have really seen a very active China in the Arctic, uh, but actually China was initially a very early active in Iceland mm -hmm. with the free trade agreement in 2009. Chinese tourism has also blossomed mm -hmm. in Iceland in addition to uh, American uh, tourism. Yet there have been some challenges of ch as Chinese entrepreneurs have tried to uh, purchase uh, land. Uh, help us understand, again, from a domestic standpoint, mm -hmm. how you view China. You said that this is good news. We want that investment. There are some, I put myself in that category, a little skeptical about uh, China's uh, broadening uh, footprint, infrastructure footprint in Iceland. Help us uh, understand the domestic underpinnings of some of that. I know that's the Justice Minister's portfolio a little bit, but you have the external portfolio. <coughs> no, I, I think you could say that uh, the Icelanders share your view. Okay. 
So uh, when uh, this idea came up to buy uh, this piece of land, which was actually the same size as Malta. Size of Malta? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, uh, it, and it didn't go through because uh, there was a, uh, the public was not, not for it. They, because we, we had a long and good relations with China. Uh, and uh, we find it important, but we, I think that Iceland in general are aware of uh, that we, you need to be aware of that China is not a Western country. And even though we surely want to cooperate as we have done uh, more than we have, uh, even more than we, we do now, we have a lot of trade be between the countries, not only tourism, I mentioned the geothermal uh, work that we are doing there. And, uh, and they, of course, have prospered also for, because we are a good market. We are not the largest market in the world, but it's, uh, it's good to sell Icelanders. We are good consumers. So, but uh, we are also m very much aware of uh, the big picture. And uh, that's the reason I am drawing the attention to when I come to Washington or if I go to uh, European capitals. It's so important that the Western nations uh, are aware of the changes in the Arctic there are both challenges, opportunities, and uh, we need uh, the main players there also. And we take it very seriously, our leadership in the Arctic Council in the next, next two years. And uh, because, uh, just as I mentioned in, in the speech, that uh, there, are, there are threats there and we need to be aware of it. One thing I just wanted to pull in, um, you're right, Arctic security is becoming a bigger issue, but we don't have a place to talk about it. You can't talk about it at the Arctic Council. The NATO-Russia Council is not mm. right now an appropriate venue. Uh, are you concerned or help us understand where we can have a discussion about an increasing uh, Russian military posture, which uh, in some ways Trident Juncture is, is going to be an expression of understanding what that mm -hmm. uh, and, and deterring that effect. But where do we have this conversation? I ask everyone this question because I don't know the answer. <coughs> well, of course, when it comes to the security, I mean, uh, uh, the, the alliance which we, we built everything going on is NATO. Yeah. And we need to have a both. And I think that uh, the- But we haven't had a conversation at NATO on the Arctic, have we? No, uh, I think that though every nation in NATO, at least as I understand, have the same position as, for example, Iceland, that we try also to have a dialogue with the, with the Russians. We have a lot of dialogue with the Russians, and I think it's very important at the same time that we give the, uh, uh, the message that they cannot uh, do what they have been doing. It's not acceptable, and it needs to be, uh, uh, we have to do it in, in, in the way that they understand it. But, uh, I mean, of course, you'd like uh, to have more dialogue between the NATO countries and, and, uh, and Russia. It's not happening at the moment. You could be, uh, it's hard to be very optimistic about big changes in the near future. But uh, I think that this policy, twofold policy, either to uh, have a, a, give a very strong signal that this behavior is not acceptable, and then the dialogue is the way to uh, find ways to, to uh, ease the tension. So I'm going to ask the, my final question before I turn to the audience on the one issue that you didn't talk about mm. in your uh, remarks, and just to focus on the trade. In addition to your seeking a U.S. Uh, free trade agreement potentially down the road, uh, we're also watching the economic implications of Brexit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just love your uh, reflections as mm. a, a, a close neighbor and trading partner, a security partner, obviously. The uh, GI-UK gap has mm. brought you uh, together. What is your perspective uh, on Brexit as a non-EU member, but a member of the European economic area, uh, perhaps a model that could be looked at? Yeah. Uh, give us your reflections on Brexit. Well, uh, first of all, it's a priority for us. Sure. Uh, Brexit, because uh, the most important trading partner is the US, and then comes the U UK, yeah. and then, of course, we have all this cooperation both between the people and also when it comes to security and, and other things. So uh, I'm not sure they are, uh, well, the message I give both to the UK and the US is just very simple. Don't put any trade barriers in Europe. It would be absolutely ridiculous. And they have to find a way. I mean, we are not a member of the EU. European cooperation is much more than the EU. Some nations are EU, some are not. Some are in EFTA, some are in EEA, some are in Euro, some are in Schengen, some are in NATO. And it's not a problem. And we should try to find a way uh, 
as quickly as possible, as smooth as possible, because the UK is not going anywhere. Uh, the British Isles will not go to the Pacific, they will stay there. And uh, if we have some uh, trade barriers in the near future in Europe, everyone will lose. So that's just the message I give. We, of course, not active. It's not in our hands. To uh, they have to find out themselves the UK and the EU. But I think uh, this should be sorted out uh, as quickly as possible, for the reason that if we look at the big picture. Then we have uh, this threat in North Korea, as you, you mentioned. We have seen these economic superpowers, who is a very good news, but they do not share our values. We see the threat from Russia, just to name few. I mean, this is the time that we uh, Western nations should uh, stick together and uh, fight for our, our values. And uh, if one nation wants to leave the, some part of, of European cooperation, and they do it in a democratic way, then that should be just dealt with in, in, uh, in a manner that uh, we can go forward. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let me turn to our audience for any questions or comments for the minister. If you could raise your hand and identify yourself, we'll get to your question. I see two right down the front, and we'll take those right now. Thank you. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an intel analyst and a former American diplomat. I'm wondering, uh, since the last time we did this, um, Russian submarines are about 10 times quieter than they are now, and that would seem to indicate a pretty massive ramping up of American infrastructure on uh, Icelandic territory. So that's probably one thing we'd like from you. I'm wondering if you could name a couple other things you expect to hear, what we want from you, and then other than the trade agreement, which is shocking, <laughs> it's like Icelanders are going to take away American work positions. I don't know. It makes no sense. Uh, what What are the three things that uh, Icelanders would like from the U.S.? So. On both sides of the register, if you could just comment a bit. And Mr. Minister, we'll take one more question just down the rhyme there, and then we'll let you respond. <laughs> Jeff. Hi, uh, Jeff Rathke from CSIS. Uh, you talked a bit about the NATO summit, and you talked about bur the burden sharing uh, issues. Uh, beyond that, and beyond the strength and security posture that NATO has uh, in the East and, uh, and its role in the Mediterranean. I wonder if you could comment also on the more political aspect of the transatlantic relationship. Do you see a role for NATO in trying to forge a common transatlantic approach to things like Russian interference in political systems? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see that uh, role uh, and do you see it developing? Would that be a useful thing in your view? Mm -hmm. Please. <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, in general, that uh, of course we uh, we cannot uh, complain when it comes to uh, relations with with the U.S. But we though do have few things. Uh, the free trade deal is one thing, and uh, the other that we have. Uh, uh, well, it's it's a list of things that uh, I have brought up with uh, with the new administration that we need to need to fix. And uh, it's, uh, but it's nothing, couldn't say, at least at this moment, I'm quite optimistic that we, we will solve it. Uh, our ambassador here has been uh, pointing it out that we do not have this E1, E2 visas, which more or less every country in the world has, including Iran. But for uh, some strange reason, Iceland, New Zealand, and Portugal doesn't have it. Uh, so uh, that's something that we hope that will be sorted out, but it has to go through, uh, through the Congress, and, and uh, we hope that it will be solved. And there's also, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, we are quite interested to look uh, carefully into the pre-clearance uh, mm. in, in our airport, similar as the, uh, uh, Ireland has, and, and Sweden is adopting now. So in general, what we are just looking into is just uh, cooperation as close as, as possible both the U.S. and then I see also opportunities. For example, uh, Iceland and Alaska. We have direct flights between Iceland and Alaska. There are obviously so many similarities between uh, that great state and, and, and Iceland. And they are, of course, extremely imp interested in all things connected to the Arctic. So it's not only uh, the U.S. as a whole. I also see opportunities when it comes to uh, certain areas in, in, in the U.S. Um, when it comes to the NATO summit, and uh, could say, I understand the question that uh, we are, you're just looking at NATO in the near and, and, and distant future. I think it's obvious that, uh, I mean, NATO has to work well. It's a good organization, effective and, and good. But of course, we have to adapt to new threats. 
and uh, the cyber threat and the hi hyper war, that's obviously a threat we have to deal with. And it would be very strange if we wouldn't look into those things. But also we have to bear in mind that uh, you cannot uh, take security away from other things. And I think that uh, when we are showing solidarity, then we need to do more. Uh, I think that we have to give the, uh, for example, when we are dealing with the, uh, this pattern of behavior when the Russians, then we have to say we are really sticking together the, the whole way. And I am a bit worried when I hear about uh, plans on Nord Stream 2, for example. Uh, Nord Stream 1, if uh, it's a gas line from, from uh, Russia to, to Europe, goes through Ukraine, so they need to pay the Ukraines uh, some, some money. Now is the idea to take it in the sea, in the Baltic Sea, and, uh, and it will mean more money for, for Russia. And uh, we all knew what it, what it did with the profit for Nord Stream 1. They built up the military. I'm not optimistic because they will get more from Nord Stream 2 that they're going to use it for their health care or the education. And I think it will be very difficult for, to explain to the public because, I mean, when we use, lose 95% of our export in Iceland when, uh, because of uh, showing solidarity with, with other like-minded nations, I mean, someone suffers. And they, of course, point out, OK, I und we understand this because we have to share the same values, so we have to stick together. But if at the same time our allies are making a lot of profit and, uh, and more or less being free rider, we will have some difficult questions to, to, to deal with. And of course, if we're, gonna, if we're really going to give them message, then it has to be the whole way. It's not like, OK, today we are just talking about uh, uh, defense and security, and the next day, OK, now, <laughs> now we're going to make, make you so much richer. Because at this moment, and that is, of course, the biggest problem with Russia, probably, that they, you cannot foresee any other means for them to gain economically than just by selling oil and gas. So uh, I think that we need, as a NATO members and uh, Western nations, to look into uh, cooperation uh, and sticking together in a broader terms that only, not only when it comes to defense and security. Uh, Mr. Minister, I just want to follow up very quickly and then we'll, we'll close. Mm. Um, uh, the, I think the challenge with unity mm is that we have within the alliance um, members that don't agree with you necessarily on the threat assessment vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, maybe calling for lifting of sanctions early. We'll have to see if, if the Italian government forms and what its composition, but if the current constellation may form, part of its platform is to not continue sanctions, um, EU sanctions against Russia. You have dem democratic backsliding within the alliance itself, mm -hmm. Turkey, Hungary, Poland. Mm -hmm. That is a huge challenge to unity as NATO uh, looks forward to celebrating its 70 years next mm -hmm. year. Are you concerned about the health of the members of the alliance itself today at 29? This is a challenge. It's a big, it's a big question. It really is. It, it's, it's a challenge. And uh, yes, I. I and especially when it comes to uh, Turkey, which you, we, we have, uh, it's a very important ally. Very. And uh, that's one of the things we, we have been critical when it comes to the human rights, uh, we could say status in, in that country. So, I mean, this is something that uh, we need to be aware of. Sometimes things are uh, segregated, but, uh, but this is a, uh, could say a uh, battle that will never end for, for our values. And uh, of course, we would have, a, if you have a backslide in the core countries, the NATO countries, it's uh, something that we need to be, be worried about. But I think it's also that sometimes we get, uh, then again, when we take things from gra for granted and we do not nurture our friendship. I think, for example, uh, the discussion of NATO in the U.S. is maybe a little bit our fault that we haven't really nurtured the friendship with the U.S. as we should have done. At least I, I wonder if, if that's the case. Mm. Because uh, those uh, things that are so important to us that uh, if you look at, at uh, history, it hasn't always been like that. And we have seen changes in countries which have had these values and then they have uh, gone backwards. 
and uh, maybe still are there. So uh, yeah, uh, this, the, the, sh uh, the short answer is yes, I, I am a bit worried, but uh, that's just my point. We need to uh, nurture it, and I'm, I'm glad that we are dis discussing in that way at this meeting, it matters. Well, Mr. Minister, I am going to take your phrase. I think this should be the message for the NATO summit. The battle for our values never ends, mm. whether that's external or internal. Uh, thank you so much for your comprehensive remarks. We are excited uh, about your upcoming chairmanship for the Arctic Council and hope you come back and join us again to keep us updated on your activities there. With your applause, please join me in thanking Ms. Michael Garfield.